Well, if you've taught anything to anyone in your life, which I assume you have, then you know that learning is a process. Learning is a process. A helpful tool for evaluating that learning process was developed in the 1940s and 1950s. If you're a teacher by vocation, you know it. It's called Bloom's Taxonomy. Bloom's Taxonomy. It's basically a, a learning classification. It's been revised throughout the years. However, it is really the gold standard in terms of understanding the learning process even today. Bloom, Benjamin Bloom, argued that the learning process involves moving a student through a series of stages. Remembering, comprehending, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and finally, creating. So you have to come to know something before you can actually create something. And Bloom's taxonomy kind of charted the various stages in that learning process. Essentially, and according to Bloom, the challenge for the teacher is to move his or her student from defining, memorizing, and identifying from a note card, right? <laughs> Flipping through note cards, from moving through that stage, moving from that stage to creating, to developing, to generating something. So let me use this sermon as an example. That is the goal of this sermon. If I were to put the goal of this sermon this way, the goal of this sermon is to learn what Jesus means when he uses the phrase, a little while. Let's say I, I said that was the goal of this sermon. Well, it's not very dynamic, and it probably wouldn't be very helpful in the end. In other words, learning is more than just explanation. It's more than just helping you understand what that little phrase means. If I'm going to be a teacher, worth your salt, as they say, I need to help you move from a mere explanation of the passage or of any passage to action. Some kind of life-altering action. And this is a monumental task. It's a monument, mon monumental task for anyone to take up, but thankfully... I, we, we have a good example in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was the teacher par excellence. Jesus was and is the greatest teacher that ever lived. So then what's the point? Well, in our passage this morning, the disciples are confused. They're confused by what Jesus has taught them what he's teaching them in this upper room discourse. They have questions about some of the things that he said to them. In a word, you might say the disciples were perplexed. They were perplexed by what Jesus has taught them about his departure. And as the teacher par excellence, Jesus is going to respond to their confusion with a clear explanation that will lead them, I'm going to argue, into two life altering actions. It's my hope that these life-altering actions would become ours. Therefore, I offer this goal this morning. This is our thesis. This is the goal of this message. Jesus promises those perplexed by his departure to life-altering actions. Jesus promises those perplexed by his departure to life-altering actions. In the outline of our passage this morning, I'll give it to you. It's very simple. There's two parts to it. First, we'll see the perplexity in verses 16 through 19, and then we'll see the promise in verses 19 through 24. And in that promise, we'll find those two life-altering actions. They'll fall in that second section. Now, as we get into chapter 16 and verses 16 through 19, I want you to take notice as I read this. Take notice of how many times we read this phrase, a little while. A little while. So again, John 16, starting at verse 16. Jesus says, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us, A little while, and you will not see me? And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father, which he had said previously. 
So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, A little while, and you will not see me again? A little while, and you will see, excuse me, A little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me? As I said, we'll call this first section the perplexity. The perplexity. And what exactly are the disciples perplexed by? Well, the source of their confusion, as we just read, is that little phrase, or that phrase, a little while. That is the source of their confusion. What does he mean by a little while? Well, it seems to be even more difficult is that Jesus doubles the phrase a little while in his saying there. It would have been one thing if Jesus had said, a little while and I will see you no longer, That might have made some sense given the fact that Jesus had already told them that in fact he was going to depart. But then Jesus adds, and again, a little while and you will see me. What can this mean? This might have been hard enough, but then they recalled that he also said, I am going to the Father. There's a number of things to be confused about here. They're asking themselves, how in the world is Jesus going to leave, go to the Father, and then be seen by us? They can't seem to make sense of all of this. Now, even for our, for our, from our part, reading this passage today, it seems there's a couple different ways to understand the words of Jesus here. And the main problem or the main challenge isn't the leaving, but it's the coming that seems to be most difficult to understand. Does Jesus mean that he'll come again in the person of the Holy Spirit? Because he just spoke about that earlier. Is that what he means here? Is he referring to the resurrection appearances? Maybe he's speaking of the ascension or maybe the end of the age and the second coming. What exactly is Jesus speaking of when he talks about coming again and they will be able to see him? Well, as I said, the part about him leaving isn't The challenge, when Jesus says, a little while and you will see me no longer, certainly he's speaking of his coming death. As Jesus said to the Jews in John chapter 7 and verse 33, I will be with you a little longer and then I am going to him who sent me. And he told his disciples in John chapter 13 in verse 33, Little children, yet a little while, and I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Jesus has already talked about his departure, his death. Jesus will die. That's clear. Here's the answer to the mystery about his appearance. At least here's my answer to the mystery about his appearance. Knowing what we know about the resurrection, I can't see any reason why Jesus wouldn't be speaking here about his uh, post-death, his his resurrection in this verse, in verse 16, when he says, you will see me. So again, in verse 16, when he says, you will see me, I believe he is speaking about his resurrection. The disciples will see him again. And so we can understand the words this way, in a little while, that is, during my arrest and my death, you will see me no longer. But again, a little while, that is, during the span of three days, then, Jesus says, you will see me again, the resurrection. Now, if we've come to understand anything about the disciples up to this point, we know that these disciples have no category, absolutely no, no way of understanding from their perspective That Messiah would come, this one promised by all the prophets that he would come and die, first of all, and that then he would rise from the dead, and then he would leave his people in order to send another helper. These categories are, they had no space for these kind of things in their mind. You remember verse 12 from last week. Jesus said there in chapter 16 and verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. They didn't have a place for this kind of mystery in their minds. 
the perplexity of the disciples here only proves the truth of Jesus' assessment. It can't bear these things. It can't understand them. Now, before we move into the next section, I want to put a question in your mind from these verses. And I want you to just put this question in your mind, and then I want it to sit there kind of as we continue through this text. Take another look at these verses and this phrase, a little while. Notice how many times this phrase is used. It's repeated over and over and over again. In verse 16, the phrase comes up twice, a little while, a little while. In verse 17, it's found again, a little while, and again, a little while. In verse 18, it's found one more time. And then in verse 19, it's repeated twice. Seven times total, this little phrase is used in just four verses. Nowhere else in the whole discourse is such an emphasis placed on just this single phrase. Why does John repeat this phrase so many times? What's the point? Why does he want us to, to have it kind of ringing in our ears a little while, a little while, a little while, a little while? That's the question I want to put in your mind and then we'll move on. So keep that in your mind as we keep going through the text. Now, Jesus responds to the disciples' perplexity in verses 20 through 24. We're going to call this section the promise, as I said earlier, the promise. In these verses, we'll see that Jesus makes two promises to his disciples, and these promises will, will become the two life-altering actions found in this text. Look down at verses 20 through 22. So Jesus responds to their perplexity and he says in verse 20, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Here's the first life-altering action. Jesus will turn our sorrow into joy. Jesus will turn our sorrow into joy. Jesus employs a, an emphatic contrast in verse 20. You, he says, will weep and lament. The world will rejoice. These words, weep and lament, they come together in Scripture, and every time they come together, it describes a funeral. That's what these words describe. It's a, the emotions felt at a funeral. In other words, while the disciples are experiencing what you might call funeral emotions, the world is out there throwing a party. It's essentially what this verse is saying. The disciples will be sorrowful, but here's the promise, this is the promise from Jesus, that their sorrow will be turned into joy. Their sorrow will be turned into joy. It's important to note what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say that their sorrow will be replaced by joy. He didn't say that. He says their sorrow will be turned into joy. And this corresponds to the illustration that Jesus uses in verse 21. As many of you ladies can attest to, Childbirth is a very painful process. I only know it from watching. <laughs> and I've seen that it is a very painful experience. That being said, as painful as that childbirth process is, as labor is, that's not the focus of the illustration that Jesus uses. That's not that the point of the illustration. is isn't to highlight the pain necessarily. The central thought is the state of mind the mother has before and after birth. That's what Jesus is getting at when he uses the illustration. During labor, the woman is in distress, in great distress. However, the moment the child is born, well, what happens to that distress? It's gone. It disappears. The pain matters no longer. For it says there, a human being, a child, right? A child is born. Therefore, it's through this one event, the giving of birth, 
that both sorrow and joy are found. And so it is with the death of Jesus. The cross of Jesus Christ would prove to be a cause of great sorrow for the disciples. Jesus was gone. Their Messiah, their leader, was killed. It would be the source of great sorrow. But yet, or and yet, the cross of Jesus Christ would, pre- would prove to be the, the cause of tremendous joy. One event brings both sorrow and joy. So verse 22 gives an interpretation of the childbirth illustration. It says there, So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice. You have sorrow now during childbirth, but I will see you again on Easter Sunday, and your hearts will rejoice. Jesus says there, notice that they have sorrow now. In the moment, they have sorrow Jesus sees his death with with such certainty that its grief is even upon the disciples now. They're experiencing the sorrow even though Jesus is still with them. They feel it. It's coming. Now Jesus speaks to the nature of the joy that is promised. He says there that no one will take away your joy. The The resurrection will produce something impenetrable, impenetrable. Now, you recall in John 15, Jesus promised that our joy would be full. He said that in John 15, verse 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. We called that an inexhaustible joy. Maybe you remember I used that language. It was an inexhaustible joy. Here in John 16, Jesus tells us that no one can take away this inexhaustible joy. Jesus promises us inexhaustible and indestructible joy. It's a joy that reaches into the the horizon, reaches way out into the horizon, but it can also weather any storm. It's a joy represented in the terms of a cup. Our cup is full, and yet not a single drop slides over the edge. You ask, however, in light of that, but John, I still feel sorrow. I still have sorrow in my life. I think we all might ask that question. When you read a text like this, you say, but my joy doesn't feel indestructible. Maybe that's you. Well, I want to respond to that thought with Matthew 26. Remember I told you to put a bookmark in Matthew 26? So if you can look over at Matthew 26, and I'm going to respond to this idea that, yes, Jesus says that my joy will be full, and no one can take away my joy, but yet I feel sorrow. I'm going to respond to that conundrum with Matthew 26. Matthew 26, verses 36 through 38. This is Jesus in the garden, right? So this is, this, these events are just after he left the upper room. So they just follow Jesus saying the words we read from John 16. Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Now this is Jesus. Jesus was sorrowful. Jesus was troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful. Even to death, remain here and watch with me. Now think about this. It says there that Jesus was very sorrowful. Jesus experienced sorrow. And we know that Jesus was sinless. Jesus had no sin. But yet he was very sorrowful. At the very least, this means that the experience of sorrow isn't necessarily sin. We can at least say that. Here's something I think we can learn from the fact that Jesus experienced sorrow. Sorrow. 
and the experience of sorrow isn't necessarily sin. I think we can deduce that even the most faithful Christians might experience sorrow, even deep sorrow, sadness and despondency. They might become, as Jesus was, very sorrowful. I don't know if you realize this or not, but the the prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon, he struggled with despondency and sorrow his whole life. It mostly came as a response to chronic illness. If you have sorrow because of chronic illness, well, Charles Spurgeon had the same struggle. He suffered from gout. In his first experience with the disease, he wrote, quote, My spirits were sunken so low that I could weep by the hour like a child, and yet I knew not what I wept for. Have you ever been there? Will you weep so much and you're so sorrowful that you even forget why you're, what, what you're sorrowful over? Spurgeon was the prince of preachers. On his emotional struggles, he wrote, quote, causeless depression cannot be reasoned with, nor can David's harp charm it away. He says, as well fight with the mist as with the shapeless, undefinable, yet all beclouding hopelessness. It's like fighting the mist. You can't fight your way through it. I think it's fair to say, then, that what Jesus doesn't mean in John 16, 22 is that Christians will never experience sorrow. I don't think that's true. I think, in fact, Christians do experience sorrow. Jesus experienced sorrow. And You experience sorrow, and Charles Spurgeon experienced sorrow. We'd be lying to ourselves if we stood here and said, be a Christian, you'll never have have sorrow again. That would be a lie. In other words, when Jesus tells us that no one will take our joy, he doesn't mean we'll never experience sorrow. What I think Jesus means is that by the power of the resurrection... You and I have a kind of deep-seated joy. That's what I would call it, a deep-seated joy that abides even when we experience sorrow. And when the sorrow comes upon us, the sorrow, as Spurgeon says, that cannot be reasoned with or that David's harp can't charm away, you and I must turn our minds This is the challenge, right? Turn our minds to the source of joy. We must do that. The famous Welch preacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones, maybe you've heard of him. He taught, I love this, that we must preach to ourselves. That we must preach to ourselves. I love the question he asks, quote, Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life, he says, is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? End quote. Now, I know such a question seems antiquated in an age that's so quick to assign a diagnosis diagnosis code to any mental ailment that we experience. And yet there's a great truth in what Lloyd-Jones is saying. He writes, quote, Take the thoughts that come to you the moment you wake up in the morning. You have not originated them, yet they start talking to you. They bring back the problems of yesterday. Somebody is talking. Well, who's talking to you? Well, he says, yourself is talking to you. Now he says, kind of using the psalmist as an illustration, the psalmist's treatment was this. Instead of allowing this self to talk to him, that is the psalmist, the psalmist starts talking to himself. What does the psalmist say? Well, you remember Psalm 42. Why are you cast down on my soul? So the psalmist turns around and he asks the question, why are you sorrowful? He begins to talk to himself. Why are you cast down? Lloyd-Jones says that the psalmist stands up for himself. Self, listen to me. I will speak to you. When when sorrow sweeps over, we must remind ourselves of who God is, of what God has done, and what God has promised for us. That's what the psalmist is doing. 
If you ask that question, why am I cast down, and then you begin to understand who God is, well, that's the pathway to joy. Remember I prayed that we would understand how big God is and that God is good as we began? These things are critical. And so where does the psalmist stand? Again, from Psalm 42. After asking the question, why are you cast down? Well, the psalmist's answer is, hope in God. That's his answer. There's so much to hope in because of who God is and what he's done and what he's promised. And then he says, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And so the psalmist there is speaking to himself. He's asking himself those questions and answering them with the truth of Scripture. And that's what's shaping his psyche. This kind of treatment for sorrow sets us on a completely different trajectory than the world. It's so completely different from what the world's kind of treatment would be. How could the world do such a thing? How could the unbeliever do such a thing? If the knowledge of who God is and what God has done and what God has promised to do is the surgery against sorrow, well, what hope has the world? You see how different we are than the world? Not only that, but the world finds joy in things like relationships and work, events, security, sex, health, money. This is where the world places, places its joy. One author writes, Placing your joy in such things, quote, is like putting your life savings in a piggy bank, leaving it in a high crime district at night with a hammer, and adding a note asking people to leave it alone because it's really valuable. Well, you'd be a fool to think that your life savings was safe if you did that. On the other hand, the same author writes, quote, if our joy is in Jesus, well, we trade the piggy bank for Fort Knox. If you don't know, that's a really safe place. <laughs> we trade the piggy bank for Fort Knox, and the devil gets a plastic spoon instead of a hammer. You see, it's indestructible. It's an indestructible joy. When the trouble of this world or the people of this world attempt to take away your joy, whether through unkindness, dishonesty, gossip, slander, cruelty, or bullying, Jesus guarantees that our joy cannot be disturbed. One more illustration. One more illustration. Shelby Foote, you might know Shelby Foote, he's a Civil War historian. He commented on the North during the Civil War. He said the North fought with one hand tied behind its back. Well, what did he mean by that? Well, what Foote meant was that while the North may have been at war, much of the North didn't appear to be at war. The famous illustration of that is the school race at Harvard in 1863. That's a rowing race. So while the nation was at war up in Yale and Harvard, they were rowing. (laughs) The boys were rowing up there in competition. What's the point? While the nation was at war, much of the North was actually at peace. So it is with the Christian. We might be at war with the world, our flesh, or the devil, and yet all the while there is an indestructible peace in the north. Even in the midst of sorrow, there's a deep-seated joy to be experienced by the Christian. I love the way the author of Hebrews put it, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. So the first life-altering action is this. Jesus will turn our sorrow into joy. The second life-altering action is found in verses 23 and 24. Here we find that we have power in prayer. Power in prayer. Look down at verses 23 and 24. Jesus says, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, he says, and you will receive that your joy may be full. What does that mean? What does Jesus mean there? In that day, you will ask nothing of me. 
The key here is to figure out what Jesus means when he says in that day. In what day is he talking about? Well, in the context, Jesus is speaking of the day of his resurrection. That's what verse 22 is all about, which is what we just argued. The disciples will see Jesus again, and then their hearts will rejoice. Therefore, Jesus is speaking about the day of his resurrection. And it's in that day, the day of his resurrection, that he says, you will ask nothing of me. Well, what does that mean? Well, he means, what I think he means here is that, he, that they will ask nothing, we will ask nothing, in the sense that they've been asking now. As we've seen, the disciples are wondering what Jesus may, means in saying a little while. Jesus is saying that the resurrection is the answer to all their questions. Jesus already said as much in John 14 and verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And we saw last week in John 16, 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. They will have all their answers with the resurrection. So they will not ask anything in this sense that they're asking now. They will ask nothing of him. Jesus also adds there, that up to this point, the disciples hadn't asked for anything in his name. That is in the name of Jesus. Up to this point, the disciples would have only asked in the name of God, as any Old Testament saint would have prayed in the, in the God of, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They never asked anything in the name of Jesus up to this point. But with the resurrection, as we see here, communication with God changes in some ways. Now we're going to ask in the name of Jesus. The purpose of such asking is found there at the end of verse 24. Jesus says that your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. In these last verses, Jesus is calling on us to lay out our request to the Father in the name of Jesus in order that our joy may be full. Jesus is teaching us here that our joy can't be full it can't be complete in any other way. That being said, these words, of course, raise a question. The most obvious question, based on what Jesus is saying here, is simply, does Jesus promise to give us whatever we want? <laughs> that's, the, that's the biggest question when you read these verses. Does Jesus promise to give us whatever we want? And you know, the short answer is no. That's the short answer, no. Well, Jesus says he'll give us what we ask. He also tells us that our asking is to be done there in his name. In his name. Well, what does that mean? Jesus doesn't give us whatever we, whatever we want. He tells us to ask in his name. Well, what does all that mean? What well, means... We have to ask according to his will. In other words, we have to pray in line with his revelation. If we know something is pleasing to God or promised by God, well, we pray for it. For example, we know that Jesus will return. He said that he would come back. So it's totally appro appropriate for us to pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. We know that he's going to come back, so we ought to pray that way and in his name. We know that God is near to the brokenhearted. Psalm 34 says this. He's near to the brokenhearted and those crushed in spirit. Well, if God is near to them, then it's appropriate for us to pray for the brokenhearted and for those crushed in spirit. We ought to pray for those things. We know that God is patient towards us. Wishes that none would perish and that all would come to, repent, to reach repentance. Well, we ought to pray for those who are perishing. We ought to pray for our neighbors who don't believe. Amen. Amen. The question we have to ask in our own heart is how often we pray for what is pleasing to us. Or how often we pray for what we wish was promised by God. Friends, I wish that God promised that he would save everyone. I wish I could pray like a universalist. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that. The problem is, it's not a problem. The reality is, the truth is, is, that God hasn't promised to save everyone. 
So I have to submit my desires to that sovereign revelation. I can pray for my neighbor, pray in the name, but I have to submit that to the fact that God says that there's an elect and that only those who know his, hear his voice will come to know him. I don't know who, who those people are. And so I keep praying and hoping and longing that my neighbor, my family members, my loved ones come to know him. Everybody in this room wants comfort, good health, and good looks. <laughs> right? Everybody does. If you tell me otherwise, you're lying to me. And yet, we can say this, Jesus doesn't care about your comfort, your good health, and your good looks. If he did, ultimately, on this world, he would have promised you those things because he's good. But he never promised us those things. Here's what's great. Friends, Jesus promises us something so much better. Amen. So much better than good looks. <laughs> he promises us power and prayer and overflowing joy. These are his promises. Scripture says the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever forever. Jesus just got telling his disciples in verse 2 there that they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when, when they kill you, when you die, not just of old age, but when they actually kill you, they'll think they're honoring God. He just got done saying that to them. That's the context Jesus doesn't want us to pray for worldly comfort or ease. He doesn't want us to pray that our name would be revered or that our kingdom would, become, would come or that our will would be done. He wants us to pray that his name would be revered, that his kingdom would come, and that his will would be done. So then praying in the name of Jesus isn't some mantra that will get us what we want. Praying in the name of Jesus is aligning what we want with what he has revealed. That's what it means to pray in his name. This is why we have to know scripture. We have to know who God is. And the more we know scripture and the more we know who God is, that aligns our prayer life to his will. So we're praying exactly in the will of God. It's to pray that his kingdom and purposes would advance, not that our kingdom and purposes would, would, would be established. I'm going to try to use an illustration that my wife gave me without messing it up, which I likely will. It's kind of like a wedding coordinator. God is a wedding coordinator, and God has the wedding planned out. It's totally planned out. The services are in order, and you come to the wedding coordinator and say, Yes, but in between the prayer and the kiss, I want to play a game of ping pong up here. <laughs> now, the wedding coordinator might listen and might even be kind to you. But at the end of the day, it's not in the wedding coordinator's will that we're going to play ping pong up here. So it is with prayer. The more we understand the wedding coordinator and the wedding coordinator's plans, the more we pray and act in line with the wedding coordinator, if I can say it that way. Now, earlier, I put a question in your mind. I don't know if you remember what it was. It had to do with that little phrase, a little while. Why does John repeat, the, repeat this phrase, a little while, so many times? What is so significant about this period of time? Now, with that question in mind, I want to return to the illustration that Jesus uses of a woman in labor. The suffering and relief at childbirth is a common illustration used in the Old Testament for the suffering that Israel must endure before the Messiah comes. It's used over and over again by the prophet. The prophet Isaiah, for example, in chapter 26 
He compares Israel to a pregnant woman who writhes and cries out in her pangs when she is near to giving birth. And as a result of such pain, the prophet says, the dead shall live. (laughs) Their bodies shall rise. You will dwell in the dust. Awake and sing for joy, for the dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. The birth pains refer to a period, a little while, that must precede, come before, the coming of Messiah and the resurrection of the dead. We should also take note in that illustration of childbirth that Jesus uses that word hour. Well, the word hour is very very significant theologically in the Gospel of John. For example, John 4 and verse 23 But the hour is coming and is now here, you know this verse, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. John 5 and verse 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. In John 7 and verse 30, So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him. Why? Because his hour, it says, had not yet come. In John 12 and verse 27, Now is my soul troubled, Jesus says, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I have come to this hour. And even next week in verse 25, John 16 and verse 25, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour, Jesus says, is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of, figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. All of this, Isaiah 66 and verse 14 promises that Messiah, with Messiah, our hearts shall rejoice and our bones shall flourish like the grass. Messiah brings joy and resurrection. When you put all of this together, you begin to see that what John is writing about is something more than the resurrection. There are these kind of theological undertones that are, that are filled, that are full in this passage, that are found throughout this passage is what I'm trying to say. John is writing to us about a new age, the dawning of a new creation. Understand that doesn't negate any of the Old Testament promises to Israel. I still believe those stand. But what it does teach us is that the birth pains of the new world began at the cross. And both joy and access to God began at the resurrection. A new era has been inaugurated. You see, the disciples stood perplexed by Jesus. And yet, they stood at the precipice of a completely new world. New access to God. New power in prayer, overflowing joy was all of theirs. Of course, they couldn't see it because the cross hadn't happened yet. And so they were perplexed. Something was about to happen that was predicted from the very beginning. The seed of the woman was about to crush the head of the serpent. Jesus was about to put his hand on the tiller of this universe and point the ship back to those original promises. The garden was going to be restored. And in this present age, as we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, He has promised us two life-altering actions. That our sorrow be turned to joy and that power is to be found through prayer. It's my hope that... The, the following, the teacher par excellence, Jesus, we might have achieved our goal this morning, which was Jesus promises those perplexed by his departure two life-altering actions. And so having learned such things, how will we respond? What is our response to such things? Well, I told you that according to Bloom's taxonomy, the learning process hasn't been completed until we take some creative action. In other words, we haven't mastered a subject until we can truly apply what you've learned, what we've learned. Some say until you can teach another, right? Am I so naive to think that one sermon can change your life? Actually, I am. (laughs) 
If I didn't believe that, why would I do this? I really believe that. That one sermon can change your life. Look down at that last sentence of the passage there. So, such a weighty thing for Jesus to say. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. Man, that's just been banging up against me all week. Here's how we apply what we've learned. Ask for strength in the river. Ask that the flame doesn't consume you. Ask that the fire doesn't burn you. That's what it says. Ask for God's enemies to be thwarted. Ask for healing. Ask for unity. Ask for a friend. Ask for a husband. Ask for a child. Ask for anything and everything that is determined by God to be good. Jesus is saying that. Ask in complete submission to his perfect will, right? That's the key. Lay it up before him in complete submission to his will. Then it says, your joy will be full. Amen?